uh, really early in the morning. Welcome to SADS Facebook Live. I'm glad that you chose to join us. So on behalf of Alice Laura, who is the CEO of the Sudden Arrhythmia Death Syndrome Foundation, thank you for, for taking the time. I'm Mike Ackerman and uh, have the privilege of serving as the, as the president of the board of the SADS. And I'm really excited today to have a dear friend, colleague, and the vice president of the board, Dr. Susan Etheridge from Salt Lake City. Susan, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much for doing this. It's been great. I've looked at all of these that you've done so far. They've all been informative and they've been fun. And I think that patients must really appreciate all of this information. And it's been fun connecting as much as we can with you yeah. and my other friends. Absolutely. I think these connections are fantastic. And like Susan, we love our SADS families. And so your questions will come on in and Susan and I will field them. So feel free. Remember the, the rules of engagement. Try to make your question a short one so I can glance over and read it and, and direct it to Dr. Etheridge. We are what now six weeks, I guess, or more, depending on when we count in COVID-19 pandemic. I just looked it up. Uh, we are at 2.7 million cases worldwide and uh, approaching 200,000 deaths. The United States, we're at 880,000 cases and 50,000 deaths we crossed this morning. In ours, we've been thankfully pretty protected here at uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester. We only have about 213 cases. Dr. Etheridge area in Salt Lake City, they're approaching 2,000 cases, but have only had 20 deaths. So a case fatality rate of 1%. So Susan, what are you observing out there in Salt Lake City on the adult side and in the children's hospital? Thank you. Yes, um, in the children's hospital, thankfully, there have been no cases. Um, I Not think we great. haven't quite hit our surge, or maybe we have flattened the curve and won't have a surge. I think people in Utah are typically pretty healthy and active, and there's not a high population of smokers here, so we may tend to have milder disease. There's also big open spaces here. We're out in the middle of nowhere, and people aren't, unfortunately, are not um, gathered in in small uh, yeah. areas. And then finally, Utahns are we're rule followers. You tell us what to do, and we do it. So we're washing our hands, and we're uh, self-quarantining and we are social distancing so that's great I'm glad it's 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 pretty pretty tame there so far I hope it stays that way and it needs to and I think you know for us here at Mayo Clinic we're uh, one of the largest medical centers in the world that happens to be in a cornfield so I think we're being spared the impact of being in a huge metropolitan city so um, thankfully that and thankfully uh, there's been very few cases of our SADS families coming down with significant coronavirus infection leading to symptomatic COVID-19. Have you seen any in your long QT practice? I have not. I predominantly take care of children who we think are gonna be mildly affected or asymptomatic and may not know they have disease. But no, I haven't heard of any. I think I would, at least a child, because my group is fairly small and we're the only cardiologists in the state. And so I'm very optimistic. I, um, I think our population will weather this and weather it well. That's great. And, and you know, we had talked earlier with Arthur Wilda from Amsterdam and Elijah Bear in London and uh, Chris Samsarian down under and really our SADS families, even though it feels like this is a pandemic as a contagion grabbing everybody, it, it, it still uh, is leaving many of us corona free or, or maybe we don't know that we've had it already and have just uh, asymptomatic. But um, and speaking of, of letting us know whether you've been impacted, do go on to the SADS Foundation and fill out that survey. So we have the SADS COVID-19 survey to find out how are you doing? How are you doing from head to toe in terms of mind, body, and soul navigating this anxiety provoking time that we're in and, and fear generating? Remember I said, refuse to fear, but nevertheless, we wanna know how are you doing and whether you have had coronavirus infection. 40, Susan, have filled out the survey so far and we would love to have all of the SADS families that are connected to us 
uh, go online and fill out the survey. Yeah, it would be interesting data to present at the end of this or as this is waning to figure out, should it occur again, what is the risk to our population? And these are how we get the data. Absolutely. And I think uh, uh, knowledge is power. And uh, we're see what's happening, uh, you know, in real time as everybody is searching for answers on COVID-19 therapies and what works, what doesn't work and when will it work. And, and the only way we learn this is from the clinical trials. And is Salt Lake City, do you know, are they uh, entering any of the clinical trials? Do you know? I think they are. I, you know, certainly not in the pediatric realm, but I think at the university and at the IMC hospital, they are considering entering or have entered the clinical trials. I don't know which ones. And how about where you all, are you under a universal masking policy like we are here where we're masked, our patients are masked? We're masked and we're to wear the visors when we see patients. Um, we're masked all the time outside of the home and in the hospital. Um, and I certainly see people out and about in their masks riding their bike by my front window. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting how the masking uh, has come about and it makes sense. And just to remind everybody, it's sort of this mutual deal that we have with, with our brothers and sisters uh, next door and wherever it is. I don't know. What if I don't know that I have it right. and I'm asymptomatic? So I'm protecting you. You mask yourself. So you're protecting me. It's not as if your mask is necessarily catching droplets are firing your way. So it's it's dealing with this asymptomatic carrier business where 50% of us may have already have the have had the infection. Right. We don't even know it. And I think it's important. The one thing that I have heard that the masks will help you is to stop you from touching your face. And that that can be a, a great way to prevent you from in, having the virus enter your system. It really works. I mean, we had an update on, on our campus that we don't have a single example of a mask to mask individual, healthcare patient, family, healthcare, 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 where they've gotten infected. Mm -hmm. So everybody do do the mask thing. I guess it's uh, in vogue. My wife ordered some fashion masks uh, to wear if she had to go to the grocery store, but we're not even going to the grocery store. We're now ordering the groceries online and driving by to pick them up with the trunk open. So that's us too. Yeah. Well, we have some questions coming in. Let's let's jump in on on some of these. And we've got some greetings and thanks. And we just want to thank those of you. Uh, Eve loves your state, uh, Susan. Uh, I love you. It too. <laughs> um, well, come yeah. visit us when this is all over. And Toby is giving us a greeting from Austria, and I'm really bummed because Susan and I were to have been in Austria for a meeting. Um, recently and uh, hopefully we'll get to go to Vienna next year. Catherine's greetings from Ireland and I love Dublin. My mm. son, uh, I got to a great story there about Ireland, Susan, is I took my third son and he and I had dinner with uh, Dr. Ward. No. Of Romano Ward syndrome, which is people know is long QT. Did you take so pictures? I, I did. That was no with, good. Joe Galvin, and that was sort of one of those life career highlights. Oh, yeah, that is fantastic. Um, well, let's see. Heather, we'll start with Heather. So, Susan, this is not in long QT, but she's wondering, is are there any updates about the effects of the ARVC heart from COVID-19? She thinks she might have had COVID or was infected three weeks ago, but has tested negative. Once she's recovered, it seems like her resting heart rate has gone up. Um, 20 beats per minute, and she's in permanent AFib. Wow. A little bit involved there, um, but in general, um, anything that you'd want to tell our ARVC families to be doing more of, less of? I would, uh, of all of our SADS conditions, it is the one I might have a little bit more concern about, especially if they're a, a heart failure ARVC patient. Um, and so physical distancing in that population and certainly trying not to contract the virus. It's hard for me to uh, 
say about what she has going on. Um, there are a certain number of people who test negative but have the virus, and so antibody testing may help us know if she had it. Um, it also could just be stress. Um, make sure you're taking your medications and you haven't missed them. And Michael, I'll turn it back to you because you probably have more experience with ARVC than I do. Yeah, I think you're doing all the right things. And I guess I would definitely be checking with your primary cardiologist about your permanent AFib and, and what he or she wants to do about that. Um, I think the heart rate jumping up 20 beats per minute, that easily could be uh, understandable anxiety and, and fret and concern going on. We definitely have had our families calling us, telling us that their heart watch or their pulse thing that they're wearing is registering faster than what it did. And and I think a common denominator is is just how the anxiety engine has revved up the system. I agree. Are you, are you getting calls just in general about the anxiety, especially when the paper came out about people with, quote, heart disease are doing bad with coronavirus? Yes. And I'm always so thankful when our families have their remote monitors, their cardias, that they could actually give us a recording and I can just say, oh, it's just sinus tachycardia. And it's probably because you're stressed or nervous. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think we, SADS has done a great job of, of helping talk our families off the ledge and say, yes, first, your long QT is technically a heart disease. So is CPVT. So is Brigada. It's just not the heart disease that the paper was about, which said those elderly people with high blood pressure and heart failure and diabetes, those heart disease patients, they're not doing as well when they get infected. And we had to help people understand what's the definition of heart disease. And that's a big term uh, where a lot of entities live under that term that aren't all the same. And I think it's impressive that on this show, you have had leading um, SADS physicians sit here and say, this just has not affected our population. And I think that's very important, as will be the form that you fill out, the survey that gets filled out. I think that this will, these will be very important data when we look back on this. I think so. So do fill out those surveys. Oh, good. I got it. There's a good question for us um, from Kelly. When she gets up from sitting, she gets lightheaded and dizzy um, and was pacing at 100% before now. I can definitely tell a difference. So I, again, Kelly, lightheaded dizziness is, is we, that's a common symptom in all of our patients a lot of times, but has nothing to do with their root disease. What do you think, Susan? I agree. It's often a sign of dehydration or just not adequate nutrition. Um, dehydration being the biggest one, especially here where we live and it's starting to get warmer. And, you know, we see that in so many people who don't really have anything wrong. Um, and the, and the, again, I think stress can make that more of a problem and more something that you would worry, you would think about or notice whether yeah. it's, and it's unlikely to be worrisome. A uh, good question. I'm going to let Michelle have this one. It's a long one, but she's from Long Island, so I'm going to give you uh, the liberty of this. So, so here it is, Susan. She uh, she cares for positive COVID patients. Uh, she has asymptomatic. She's a nurse. She has asymptomatic brugada. Has a loop. Also has some other things. Um, Ehlers Danlos. She's wondering, is Plaquenil considered safe for Brugada patients or is it case by case? I think that's a great, great question. We'll talk a little bit about this. We'll linger on this topic a little bit, but in general, uh, if Plaquenil worked, would you think it's safe for a Brugada patient? What would you say, Susan? I would think if it worked, it, that I can't see any safety issues with that. How about you, Mike? No, I, I know, but I think the, the operative word there is if it works. If it works. And and maybe we should uh, linger there. So for our for our, our listeners, Plaquenil is hydroxychloroquine. And uh, many of us called out a warning over a month ago about hydroxychloroquine, Plaquenil, and we got a reaction initially from the autoimmune community because it's been used for a long, long time. 
for our patients with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis and so forth. And in that setting, in those patients, or if you're going to malaria world for malaria prophylaxis, that drug is incredibly safe. But we were arguing and saying, wait a second, uh, what's safe in that patient population doesn't automatically translate to a sick COVID-19 uh, patient. And even if it works, we got to be aware of the possibility of drug-induced sudden cardiac death. And so we put out an alert about that. But Susan, what's your take on the efficacy side of the equation? We're not infectious disease experts, but we read and we're very interested in looking for the therapeutic efficacy signal in case our patients were to get infected and call us. How do we treat them or do we let the physicians use Plaquenil on our patients? But what's your take right now on the if it works side of the equation? That I don't think we know. I don't think that there have been randomized studies. Those are studies where you have a control population who doesn't get the drug and you compare it to a population that does get the drug. I don't, I don't think the data are there yet. Um, I think there are studies underway. So I think that at some point in this viral process, we will potentially have the data. Um, I do think it's a, I do think they're using it. I, um, I was on a call yesterday with AAP and they are using it for patients coming into the hospital in um, New York City. Uh, so we will potentially get data. Um, I think there are some side effects to the medication, even in the, even in the baseline population, but certainly in our population of long QT syndrome patients, these are known drugs. Um, to lengthen the QT interval and our tersiatogenic. I think the doses that they use in malaria and in lupus and rheumatoid arthritis are far smaller than the doses that we're talking about here. Yeah. And these are often dose effect uh, arrhythmic changes. And so I think it is very important that you have a very hard to heart discussion if you are asked, are, are thinking using those medications that you you do it smartly. The uh, heart or the Heart Rhythm Society came out with a a, a plan, and Mike, you had a great algorithm on how to monitor getting baseline electrocardiograms, looking at the QT interval either um, on your remote device um, or with 12 lead ECGs, although that does increase exposure and and to eliminate all the other potential uh, rhythmogenic factors such as electrolyte abnormalities and other medications that can lengthen your QT. And, but to use it smartly when it's necessary and safely. And it, there are no data right now to my knowledge that it can be used, that it should be used prophylactically. Yeah, I think great points, um, Susan. So Michelle, a couple things to add. So if there was proven efficacy Susan and I would have zero concern of you no. receiving it for your Brugada. None at all. Uh, for our long QT patients, we would want to know that the efficacy signal, it works, is really robust before we would give that potential exposure risk. And I think uh, this, as I see it right now, the if it works is turning out to heading towards thumbs down in the sick inpatient hospitalized COVID-19 patient. It is being studied for the post-exposure prophylactic and it's a clinical trial. And it will not surprise me at all if we actually see an efficacy signal there because it actually makes more sense that the drug would help prevent virus entry rather than after it's already gotten in and done its cytokine storm and everything. So I'm eagerly waiting the signal in the post-exposure patient, which if it works in that setting, that's going to be even better because you're healthier at right. that stage. Your safety margin is going to be way more, uh, the, you'll be way more like a lupus patient where these drugs have been incredibly safe overall. And then the news flash, it just happened about an hour ago. FDA just put out an urgent caution because they've documented numerous cases of hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, sudden cardiac deaths. Right. And they put out an urgent message that these drugs should only be given in the hospital right. or in the setting of clinical trials and not in the over the phone, you might have it, let's give them, let's prescribe the Corona cocktail.
And the Heart uh, Rhythm Society said the same uh, two days ago, that this is a drug that they recommend, even just alone, Plaquenil, that they recommend being given as an inpatient. Yeah, so really important. I think some people in our healthcare community um, are guilty as charged, if you will, for having prescribed medications in a setting that the major health society said, don't do that, discourage from it, because these drugs are powerful medications and in the wrong patient, they are potentially long QT deadly. Well, let's leave that. Here's a good one from Sharon. Uh, and I think this gives a really important for our kids. She's asking, would we advise that her eight year old with CPVT to wear a mask when he or she is playing outside? If they're playing near other children, then I would say yes. If um, they're just riding their bicycle by themselves and there's no chance of coming up with another child or adult, then, then no. But I think um, it's certainly safer to do it um, if you can get them to do it. But if, if you can social distance, that would be as good probably. And for that son and daughter, that eight-year-old for Sharon, your definition of social distance is? I like six feet. It's easy to measure. It's the, it's the height of your father. There you go. So <laughs> six, here's, you've heard it, the six-foot rule. Um, uh, keep them apart. And again, remind your children that the reason they're wearing the mask is not to protect them from the danger that's out there but to protect the other person next to them just in case we don't know that we have it. And I think this is where serology testing, once we get that, is going to be huge. And what, what's going on at your institution? Where are you guys in rolling out the serology test to find out, did we already have it? We didn't even know it. And we have the antibodies for it and we're good to go. We have a very good test. Uh, we have a local laboratory that can do it. Um, you just need a doctor's orders order for it at present. I think that it's going to roll out to medical professionals soon, that, that it's recommended that they all get it, but it hasn't yet happened. Yeah. I kind of wonder, and we're now, Susan and I are just thinking out loud of, you know, we as employees, and I, I bet it's the case of Susan, I have to, I get a reminder on my birthday for my annual tuberculin test. Right. Are your flu shot? For my TB and the 100% expectation for flu shot, which by the way, Everybody out there, get your flu shot next season. Um, probably this season, no, but, but come September, do not forget to get your flu shot. Um, but do you think we might get to a point where as employees of healthcare places, we need to get our uh, COVID-19 serology test to know our status? I think it'd be great. It would be nice to know if we knew how long we would stay protected because yeah. it's different for different viruses. Um, it would be great if they said, oh, you've got a year. You don't have to worry about it for a year. Then you could just go back to work. You know? Right. Yeah. I will, I'll be curious to see. We've gone from, you know, a month ago, we weren't wearing masks in the hospital right. to now in the outpatient clinic. It's you be masked, I be masked, we all be masked together. And we get our temperature, every single one of us, patients, families, and uh, physicians, as we come into the hospital, I take my temperature twice a day at home. I'm sure you do too. What was yours today? 98.8. Ta-da! See, you beat me. Mine was 97. You're always, <laughs> you're always higher than me. Okay, here's Carrie. Hi, Carrie from Virginia. Um, she's wondering if her skinny... I would say slender, slender, 12-year-old daughter with CPVT and an atrial septal defect hmm. could benefit from an Apple Watch because she still has a hard time re reporting events to us. Well, oh, I like that question because we could unpack this in a couple of different directions. But what do you think? Are you having your CPVT patients being told to have an Apple Watch on? Not yet. Um, we certainly will help them if it's possible to get one or to get a cardio device, if that's something that they're interested in doing. Um, it, it tends, in my mind, the Apple Watch tends to be really fun right when they get it. And then 
three or four months later, they forget how fun it was. Um, whereas the parents seem to have a little bit more control over the cardia, which we will recommend um, also. Um, I think there's other ways to make sure she does what she's supposed to do. Um, alarms for taking her medications, et cetera. Um, what about you, Mike? What do you think? Yeah, I guess the one part for Carrie that I'm wondering about is the part of having a hard time reporting events to us. And I think here's where we could encourage our CPVT families that a child like her 12 year old daughter, our patients don't really have miniature events that the watch could catch. Right. I mean, they either faint or they don't. And, and so whatever sensation she's having, if she's sensing occasional palpitations, well, palpitations or flutter or sensations are so incredibly common in our preteens and teens and never meaning that her CPVT heart is irritated or agitated in any way. So I haven't made a point of having any kind of heart rate monitoring or pulse monitoring okay. so far and haven't needed it. I agree. Um, Sarah, thanks, Sarah. Sarah's recently been diagnosed with type one long QT syndrome from Susan, and she also has Raynaud's. And have we found a connection at all between long QT and Raynaud's? Or do we feel it's an underlying condition that could affect how COVID-19 would affect her if she were to get coronavirus infected? Ooh, good question, Sarah. It is a good question. So I don't know of any relationship between long QT syndrome type one and um, Raynaud's. Raynaud's is fairly common. And so it could just be that that common thing happened to you and is entirely unrelated. As far as, um, I don't think that somebody with Raynaud's or somebody with long QT syndrome is at increased risk from getting the COVID virus. And the only thing I would say that is a worry is if you got the COVID virus, you just need to be very good and very aggressive about fever control. Great. I, I totally agree. I, the only, I've not seen any increased rate of Raynaud's. The only thing though is keep in mind if they've, how, depending on how they've treated you with your beta blocker, Susan and I have seen plenty of beta blocker associated Raynaud's phenomenon. And we may have to try a different beta blocker, adjust things. So take it at a different time of day, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And hello, Jan. She's just saying hello to me. I guess I'll say hello back. Oh, I like that. Oh, I love that family. Um, <laughs> so Kelly is coming in late. Uh, maybe we addressed it. Let me see. Her three-year-old daughter, Susan, has type 2 long QT. Mentioned something about COVID possibly influencing the QT interval. And, and the family was told that the family should call the doctor if she shows any COVID symptoms. What is known about any connections between COVID-19 and the QT interval? I think we're back again to only the fever bit. So it's been published to increase the QT interval in type one. I've seen it in type two. I've seen it uh, fever change the QT and cause T wave alternance or real bad repolarization. Yeah. And once the fever was controlled, the QT returned to the baseline. So I really do think it's fever. Um, however, I think you should contact your doctor if you have COVID symptoms, regardless yeah. of whether you have long QT syndrome or not. And I think that brings us to the Brugada family and to Jan about mentioning something about Brugada syndrome. And I think you hit on it. The fever is fever, fever, fever from any febrile illness. Get that fever lowered. And we're recommending Tylenol now. We think that that's probably the way to go. There are other things that you can do, cold compresses under the armpits, over the head, places where you can um, cool the child down. Um, but I think that that is the most uh, important part of this whole viral discussion, actually. Yeah. And I asked, I'd be curious what you think, Susan, because I asked Dr. Samsarian about this. I've been seeing out there um, some recommendations that if our Brugada kids uh, or Brugada adults get fever, to take Tylenol and dash into the emergency department. And we have not been advising that, but I've seen that out there. And I'm just curious, um, what's your guys' recommendation if you get a Brigada family calling saying our child has a temperature? Get the temperature down. And I would stay away from the emergency rooms 
in this day and age, if at all possible, it's where you're more likely to be exposed to somebody with COVID. It's expensive. Um, and I'm not sure it's absolutely necessary, especially if you're at a fairly low risk Brugada patient, somebody who doesn't, doesn't have a history of syncope or, um, or sudden death. And, and so I think the emergency room right now is potentially not a super safe place to be. Yeah. And if you needed medical attention, absolutely go there. But I think this is one that you could ride out at home. Um, uh, Kelly, back to your point though, about the doctor uh, saying that the COVID, the, so again, COVID-19 technically, that's the disease. The, the virus is SARS-CoV-2. And if we get infected with the virus, I think what that EP is referring to is this virus can directly infect the heart muscle. And we've seen reports of it mimicking uh, ST segment elevation and heart attacks and people running a heart attack drill when they're not. And there's also some data that if you get really bad COVID-19 disease, you can have a huge, what's called a cytokine storm where with an outpouring of interleukin-6. And there are some studies showing that interleukin-6 can directly prolong the QT interval. And so it is possible in that way that a long QT patient, if they got infected, they could have their QT lengthened by the COVID-19 interleukin-6, all the more reason that that patient should not get put on hydroxychloroquine or any other QT prolonging drug without calling your long QT physician. That would be a pretty sick patient though, don't you think, Mike? Yeah. Yeah, this is not going to I mean, remember, the, the, the tragedies we hear is not the norm of COVID. 50% of us won't even know we had the infection. And I think it's somewhere for the other 50% that are symptomatic, the vast majority don't get hospitalized. Especially the young and the healthy. Absolutely. Uh, Shannon has, uh, oh, I like this one, Shannon. Um, Susan, her 12-year-old son looks like he has a double long QT. He has type 1 and type 8 long QT, and he has it being treated with only a defibrillator internal. Why would COVID-19 be worse than any flu or any other disease virus he might get? Well, only for the, the fever reason, although flu can cause fever. This seems to be a pretty feverogenic virus mm -hmm. compared to RSV or compared to paraflu. The other would be the, the cytokine burst that a very sick patient with this could get, and that potentially yeah. could cause trouble. Yeah. And, but I think, I think Shannon's point is kind of good at this. We are emphasizing this now, but really all of our SADS families during any febrile illness should be taking care of themselves. That's right. Let's see. We're running towards the top of the hour. Um, and I got a couple really good ones. Oh, Toby is wondering about flu shots for kids flu too. Shots. <laughs> yes, flu yeah. shots. Obviously take it to your general pediatrician, family doc. If there's any potential exception to getting the flu vaccine, there are few, very few. Very few. Um, almost everybody can get one. Um, oh, we'll maybe end on this one. Um, so this is from Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Her husband has type one long QT, very low risk profile. She loves her husband. She didn't say that, but I know it because I know that. <laughs> um, he's, he's not on beta blockers, but he does take Losartan for high blood pressure. And they've been seeing some reports about Losartan. Very good question. Yeah. And have you seen any studies? Um, could him taking Losartan offer some sort of protection from COVID-19? Maybe you have comments about that, Susan? Yeah. Th this I take very personally because I too take Losartan. And so I've at least read the answer of every single study that's come about. And there are no data. The best data I have seen is stay on your medication if it's working. And um, there are no data that it necessarily makes it better or it necessarily makes it worse. There's theories on both sides. 
But my advice is stay on your medication if it's working for you, which is what I've done. That's great. And I agree completely. And stay tuned on that one, Michelle. I think there's going to be some exciting news coming out in the near future um, that may tilt the balance towards Losartan may in fact be protective and have good reason to be protective. So <laughs> staying on it has good merit and okay. we'll stay tuned on that. Ah, Susan, we are coming towards the end. This has been so much fun with so you and fun. with the family. What would you, anything you would want to share in closing to them, any reminders to them? Um, Two things, wash your hands, very important. And I asked my kids to wash it for as long as it takes to sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And two, thank you all. It is just a joy and a pleasure to be able to take care of this population, all my patients, but in particular, this sad pop SADS population has, they're dear to my heart and I miss seeing you in person and we'll get back there. That's great, Susan. Well, it's been wonderful having Susan with us and, and she has been a dear, dear friend. Uh, we have been a president and vice president of SADS Foundation for a long time and we hello. love it. <laughs> yes. yeah, we love it and we love uh, getting to partner with Alice, Laura, our CEO, who has been leading and guiding this organization. So stay connected to us at SADS, get to know us at SADS, uh, fill out that survey if you go to www.sads.org, I know times are tough, but if you have uh, an opportunity to give a financial blessing to us at SADS, it's in the top right corner, donate now, and you could let us know that, that we're being of value to you and your families. We're excited. We're gonna join you again on Monday. We had to reschedule the Timothy syndrome focus conversation to Monday, but we'll be joined on Monday by Drs. Molly Shaw, Paul Thornton, and also Catherine Timothy, for which the syndrome is named after. And then next Friday, the same time, we'll be joined uh, by a dear friend of, of ours, Dr. Sylvia Priori in Italy. So until then, I got a couple things that I show you. You are watching some people grow up with me, but this is one of the blessings of this awful time that we're in is we get to stay together. So this is Catan. Some of you know it. And if you haven't seen this, we've been uh, in the Ackerman home. We have had Catan every night for 30 days. I've never been with my kids for 30 days straight <laughs> uh, ever. And here, if you look, if you look and you can see the white, I won. <laughs> Right. And then here's for the families. There's mm -hmm. Bella, who loves it when I'm at home working from the office. She sits by my side. And last, here's Jade and Ruby. 87 it's days beautiful. old today. And haven't seen her since February 16th live. So that's Jade and Ruby Lorraine, everyone. So thanks for joining us. Stay safe out there. Stay physically distanced. Susan, six foot of rule, tall as your tall dad. Tall as your dad. And, but stay very, very connected. And we're going to all get through this together. Take care, everyone. Blessings. Bye, everybody.